Hello and welcome to the Centre for Independent Studies. I'm Tom Switzer. Now for more than four decades, CIS has supported classical liberal economics. Private enterprise, fiscal discipline, sound money, small government and productivity enhancing economic reforms that will create permanent incentives to work and invest. We also believe that the first responsibility of the state is to protect its citizens. So it's been entirely understandable why, faced with a once in a century global pandemic, unusual measures have been taken to try to suppress the coronavirus and keep the loss of life to a minimum. Jonathan Friedland, the distinguished British columnist, quipped at the height of the crisis in March last year, just as there are no atheists on a sinking ship, there are no free marketeers during a pandemic. It's true. But that does not mean the federal government is immune to criticism from those of us on the classical liberal side of the public policy debates. And since May's federal budget, CIS has been among the federal government's critics. Indeed, we've criticised the Prime Minister Scott Morrison and the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, of embracing the political left's economic credentials as interventionists and big spenders. So it's only fitting that we at CIS should invite the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, to take our questions and we're thrilled he's accepted our invitation. Josh, thanks so much and welcome back to the Centre for Independent Studies. Good to see you, Tom. Nice to be with your members. Now, the latest economic statistics are, are incredibly strong. Unemployment's down, growth is up. Meanwhile, the S&P has affirmed the AAA credit rating. Does this mean that the government and the RBA are overdoing the fiscal and monetary stimulus? No, it does not. Um, what it does mean is that the Australian economy has shown remarkable resilience. And as you say, those job numbers yesterday were very telling. Unemployment fell from 5.5 to 5.1%. We saw 115,000 jobs created in the month of May. 85% of those jobs were full-time jobs. Uh, we've seen underemployment down, the participation rate up, and nearly a million jobs created since last May. Um, the other good point from the numbers yesterday was that even after the end of JobKeeper, uh, we have continued to see the unemployment rate trend down, and in net terms, around 84,000 new jobs created since the end of JobKeeper. And as you know, that was a contested decision. Uh, our political opponents said that uh, we should have kept that program going, and we did mm. not. That's all true, but what about the, the, the threat of inflation? I mean, those expansionary policies, the big stimulus, the fiscal stimulus, uh, taken together with the RBA's almost zero interest rates and quantitative easing, won't, isn't there a danger here that that will lead to an inflation surge prompting a lurch to much higher interest rates, even a recession? Well, that's not the expectation of Treasury. Um, in fact, they see inflation staying below the band uh, next year. Uh, and the band being 2 to 3%. We haven't seen inflation at a sustained level in the band since 2014. Mm. Uh, and we've uh, obviously seen historically low interest rates over the course of this pandemic. So we're confident um, that, uh, yes, we'll see real wages pick up over time. Uh, inflation will pick up over time, but we're not about to see a surge in inflation. Okay, but we have seen a surge in inflation in the United States and across Europe, so Australia may not be far behind. This is Larry Summers, the former Treasury Secretary in the Clinton administration. Uh, he believes that bubbling US inflation will overheat the economy, ultimately forcing the Fed to slam the brakes by raising interest rates. Now, according to Summers, that might cool rising prices in the United States but only at the cost of plunging the US into a new recession and destabilising the global economy. He's not alone. How would you respond to Larry Summers? Well, that's not the view of Phil Lowe at our central bank or, or indeed of Treasury. Uh, Phil Lowe has said uh, many times publicly he's not about to, to lift interest rates uh, and he could see them um, staying low for some time. And as you know, the cash rate is at uh, 0.1 of a percentage point. So... I, uh, I, you know, I'm watching this situation very closely. Um, we uh, we saw a temporary increase in inflation in, in um, inflation over the course of this year, but that was just because we saw um, deflation last year. And mm -hmm. in the in the June quarter of last year, Tom, we saw 
um, the biggest fall in the CPI uh, on record. As you know, there were cheap, cheaper rents, uh, cheaper fuel, and free childcare and, and the like. But that was all related to the pandemic. So we're not expecting to get back into the band at a sustained uh, rate of inflation for a little while yet. Okay, now you're obviously upbeat about the economy and the statistics show that. We've got the labour market figures this week, uh, the recent growth figures, two consecutive growth uh, quarters of robust growth and, as we mentioned before, the AAA credit rating. But uh, the budget is based on a series of assumptions uh, that, that will be fully vaccinated by the end of the year. Uh, there'll be no co major COVID outbreaks. There'll be open borders in a year. The record low interest rates will continue. Now, given all this uncertainty, why should the private sector, which will lead this recovery, why should it have any confidence uh, in a bullish outlook beyond uh, the next 12 to 18 months? Well, if you actually even look at yesterday's job numbers and the March quarter national accounts, they beat market expectations and were ahead of what you would call bullish forecasts in the budget. Um, so the reality is that the economy has performed on the upside, uh, even beating our most optimistic forecast, you're right, there are assumptions in the budget. There are assumptions and they're not policy decisions. They're based on the best advice to us. One includes the, uh, the gradual opening of the international borders from the middle of next year. But again, um, that will be dependent on a lot of different factors. But we are still in the middle of the pandemic. We saw a lockdown in Victoria just, uh, just recently. Uh, we saw a lockdown in Western Australia um, very recently. And and we've also seen, you know, new variants of, of the virus abroad. So these are challenging times. That's why we've kept the foot on the accelerator, um, Tom. That's why it's not a time for an austerity budget, but we're always seeking to be fiscally responsible. And we did bring to an end some of those emergency support payments like JobKeeper, like the cash flow boost, um, like the temporary COVID supplement. And to your point about the private sector-led recovery, um, we're, we're on a unity ticket on that. I mean, I'm firmly of the mm. belief that the difference between us and the other side of politics is that we want to see the private sector lead us out of the recovery. That's why I put immediate expensing incentive in the budget. That's why we've provided more tax cuts for families. Okay, but back to the budget. It, the revenue is based on high price of uh, iron ore. And of course, China's growth has been a big contributed to Australia's record prices for iron ore, yet relations between our two nations are self-evidently at their lowest mark in more than 50 years. And if the past is any guide, the soaring terms of trade helped by the, the, the rising uh, uh, iron ore price, uh, that will not last. What happens if the price of iron ore declines dramatically or say uh, China finds another market for iron ore? Well, they're important questions to ask, so let me um, do my best here to answer them. Firstly, the iron ore assumption in the budget is a conservative one. We expect the iron ore price, which is around $200 today a tonne, to come down to $55 a tonne uh, by the, uh, the, the March quarter next year. Now, some people criticise us on that by saying, well, that's unrealistically low at $55 a tonne. The benefit to the budget is obviously on the upside if the price remains high. And we've seen a strong improvement to the budget bottom line, more than $50 billion compared to what was forecast in last year's budget uh, for 2021. And that's been driven. Yes, commodity prices have played a role. But the other bigger reason has actually been the labour force strength with more people in work, so higher revenue, lower welfare payments. That's actually what's driving an improved bottom line. Now, with respect to your question about China longer term and their demand for our iron ore, they can't easily replicate both the quality and the quantity of our iron ore. Uh, yes, they're looking at uh, extra, um, uh, extra resources and supplies out of Africa, but that will take some time if, if they can do it. With respect to Brazil, you know they've had um, issues with dam collapses and, and supply, and obviously COVID has run rampant over there as well. Um, and they're not as big a producer as Australia is. Um, so our iron ore helps underpin tens, if not hundreds of thousands of jobs across China, because China's not only using it for their industrial development, but also China is the world's largest steel exporter. 
and our iron ore, our coal, plays an important role there. Okay, now keeping with the budget, one of the reasons why the budget deficit was so difficult to close after the global financial crisis in 08 and 09 is that the Labor governments of Prime Ministers Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard, they built, you know, permanent spending increases into the budget on the basis of temporary revenue gains, a bit like the iron ore price. Uh, it sounds familiar. This is what the Financial Review calls uh, Labor's spending monuments, uh, monuments. So they're things like, you know, the NDIS, the Gonski inspired spending on schools. Question, hasn't the government accelerated what the uh, Financial Review and we have called uh, a debt funded modern entitlement culture in Canberra? No. And Tom, we've actually seen um, the underlying cash balance or the, the deficit come down from 7.8% uh, of GDP down to it's expected to be 1.3% at the end of the forwards. Um, we're seeing a fiscal consolidation um, that is faster um, than uh, out to 2026, that is faster than any of the other eight countries that have a AAA credit rating from the three leading credit rating agencies. And as I said, we've seen over 2021, more than $50 billion improvement to the budget bottom line compared to what was forecast at the, at the, at the last budget. Now, in relation to new expenditure. Yeah, so things like aged care and childcare, yeah. There is new expenditure in this budget uh, on some of, those, um, some of those areas like aged care. That, the Royal Commission uh, made very clear um, the increased need um, for uh, better services, better governance, uh, and more and more uh, and and more resources into that into that sector. So what we've done is we're providing respite for carers. We're providing retention bonuses uh, for for nurses. We're helping the private aged care providers um, as well as the not for profit ones. Uh, with better governance and the like. With childcare, um, I see this as a workforce participation um, issue with Treasury estimating that up to 300,000 additional hours worked a week will come out of our, our reforms. And our reforms, Tom, are, fo are focusing on those families with a second, a third or a fourth child um, who may be uh, receiving uh, these these childcare services. Okay, but back to the budget. We are a, a medium-sized commodity exporting economy. We need to rebuild the budget buffers, uh, just like uh, our uh, friends and heroes John Howard and Peter Costello did. That helped us weather the global financial crisis. So we need to be on guard for the next external shock. That's why budget repair is important. Robert Carling, a colleague of mine who was a senior economist at both the New South Wales and Commonwealth Treasuries. He's worked at the IMF and the World Bank. He says the budget papers show that parameter and other variations will benefit the budget by $18.6 billion in 23-24, but instead of allowing that to lead to a lower budget deficit and less debt, the government is spending almost all of it. Josh Frydenberg. Well, there are programs where we are seeing parameter variations with extra expenditure like the NDIS, but we federally don't necessarily have the ability um, to, to shape the different programs um, that have been offered under that under that NDIS, as you know, it's a combined uh, responsibility of, of the federal government and, and, and the states. And the Prime Minister made a speech about this recently and, and, and the work and the reforms um, that, we are, that we are focused on in order to ensure that very good program remains sustainable over time. So we have seen uh, extra expenditure uh, as a result of higher cost programs in the NDIS, but also more than 100,000 people coming on that program in over the course of the last 12 months. But the, by and large, the programs that we have announced in this year's budget um, have a definitive prime time frame, like the low and middle income tax offset extension for a year, mm. like the immediate expensing and the loss carry back measures out to 2023. Um, they're about generating more private household consumption, returning money to, to people, uh, through um, through tax relief, which is consistent with our values um, to encourage aspiration and reward for effort, but also encourage the private sector um, to to make 
um, more investments and that capital deepening is going to be critical to productivity growth in the future. Okay, what about the escalating levels of debt? Borrowing, after all, remains at astronomical levels. Now, net debt is forecast this year by June 22 from $617 billion, that's 30% of GDP, to rise to $729 billion, that's 34.2% of GDP. It's not falling, it's rising approximately $100 billion. Well, a couple of points. Firstly, we have a two-stage fiscal strategy, and we're in the first stage now, which is basically to consolidate the economy at a time when it's experienced the largest economic shock since the Great Depression. Let's not forget back last year, Tom, Treasury thought the unemployment rate could reach 15%, um, that the fall in GDP could be more than 20%. I didn't come into this job as a Liberal Treasurer, <laughs> expecting that I would be putting in place an economy-wide wage subsidy like JobKeeper. But when I rang John Howard and asked uh, for his view when I explained to him what we were about to announce, he said, Josh, at times of national crises, there are no ideological constraints. So we did what was required. Now, our net debt to GDP uh, will peak at less than half of what it is today in the UK and the US, and I believe that it is a, it, it's, it's at a point where we can sustain that. That being said, um, we do obviously need to be very conscious of rising debt levels. We need to be very conscious of the need that our spending needs to be directed towards productivity enhancing investments. Okay, but let's look at the Treasury figures. Last year, the government also thought that debt would rise by $100 billion from $703 billion to $812 billion. But things turned out better than forecast last year. So this year's starting point is $617 billion rather than $703 billion. Uh, does this show really stellar economic management or does it just show how wrong Treasury's forecasts were for last year? Well, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic and there are a lot of variables and you yourself have just referred to the uncertainty that is, that's out there. So um, you remember John Kenneth Galbraith famously once said, uh, Tom, um, <laughs> you know, uh, economic forecasting uh, makes astrology look good. Um, uh, you know, that's... <laughs> So it is, it, it's, a, it's a difficult job um, in the best of times, let alone in the middle of a pandemic. Um, but the net debt to GDP, which is a key indicator of the fiscal sustainability of the economy, uh, is better each and every year compared to what was forecast in last year's budget. Um, we are obviously uh, still facing significant challenges we have spent what we think is necessary. We have done the bulk of the heavy lifting. Um, we, have, um, uh, we have committed uh, more than twice uh, what the, uh, the states and the territories have committed combined. So we at the federal level have done the bulk of the heavy lifting. But I want your members to understand that um, we've done it in a way that's consistent with our liberal values and philosophy. And I'm talking about um, uh, providing tax relief, which we've done. I'm talking about providing business investment incentives. I'm talking about encouraging home ownership. And I'm talking about supporting uh, retirees, self-funded retirees, and encouraging personal responsibility. And of course, supporting our regions. All of that can be seen uh, in the budget. Okay, now you're talking about all those things, but what about the things you were talking about nearly a year ago when you said, Josh, that you drew inspiration from Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan because they successfully prosecuted economic reform in the 1980s. We at CIS praise you. I wrote several articles uh, for the Financial Review and the Melbourne Age praising you. I was even on the ABC of all places praising Thatcher, Reagan and Josh Frydenberg. Yeah, but hang on, the question here is where is that Reagan-Thatcher style pro-growth reform agenda? Well, firstly, we saved uh um, the Australian economy from a winter of discontent to uh, to bring in a, <laughs> uh, with uh, with Labor's three hundred eighty seven billion dollars of higher taxes the last, but not through market oriented reforms. Well, they were we've, we've cut taxes. So let me just point out a few significant structural reforms. Firstly, we've legislated through the Parliament, and it's a contested point because Labor is threatening to re to attempt to repeal it if they ever got into government. 
significant tax reform that will abolish our whole tax bracket, the 37 cents in the dollar tax bracket. And you'll have a tax bracket from $45,000 to $200,000. Mm-hmm. People pay a marginal rate of no more than 30 cents in the dollar. Just yesterday, Tom, we've got through the parliament the most significant superannuation reforms since compulsory super came in in 1992. You know, um, stapling uh, your initial super fund account to you is, over the course of your career, bringing um, accountability to underperforming funds, allowing people to choose uh, by enabling them to compare the 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 the, the returns and the fees of the, their own mm-hmm. super fund, putting in a best financial interest test. We've got mutual. Um, recognition uh, so you can move more freely between states and work. That's a massive red tape reduction. The reforms we did on insolvency, um, their reforms John Howard told me he wished he had done, uh, which enables... Yeah, okay, but look, uh, Gary Banks, uh, I'm sure you know Gary, long-time head of the Productivity Commission. He's now a senior fellow here at CIS. He says that productivity growth was weak before the pandemic. And, uh, and it seems we're destined to go back to the unsatisfactory state of affairs uh, as soon as the sugar hit of the stimulus subsides or that demand stimulus. So where are the supply side structural reforms to put in place to boost productivity as we emerge out of the pandemic? Well, I've just been talking to you about cutting red tape with mutual recognition. I'm just talking about insolvency. Some of the digital transformation uh, changes around the consumer data right. Um, the tax reforms I referred to now on industrial relations reforms. Um, I know as well as you do um, that a more flexible labour markets create more jobs. Um, remember John Howard more than 40 times tried to get his unfair dismissal laws through but kept running into roadblocks in the Senate. We tried with significant um, with significant vigour to get our industrial relations reforms. Some may have said they were even modest, but we ran into roadblocks. And even something as simple as extending the, the life of an enterprise agreement for a greenfield project from four to eight years was blocked by the Labor Party and the union. So we've been trying to do these, some of these reforms. I've got some response yeah. to lending reforms before the parliament. Again, that's red tape reduction. That's supply side stuff. But, you know, it is not easy to get it through. Just to, to demonstrate Banks's point, the Productivity Commission just this week came out with a report called Productivity Update and it points out that the, uh, the slow growth of average incomes in the, in the, last, uh, in the last decade and, and the contribution of, of low productivity growth to this. And meanwhile, you have a story today in the Financial Review. This is based on the, uh, the Swiss World Competitiveness Yearbook. It says Australia has scored its worst result in 25 years in a global ranking competitiveness. Now that's pretty dire. Doesn't all that highlight the need to return to say workplace relations reform so that when inflation starts rising, wage growth can go in accordance with it or even or even exceed it. What, what, what's the status on uh, industrial relations reform, Josh? Well, something like the Greenfield site um, changes, I mean, I'd like to see them come back and prosecuted and pass through the parliament. Um, you know, that just makes sense. Um, and it's unbelievable that the, the Labor Party, the unions, um, continue to, to oppose that. So I think there is scope yeah. for further flexibility around our labour market. Um, and, but again, it's a, it's a, it's a fierce political battle um, here every day to try to get... Oh, and, that's, and that's well understood. And it's easy for people in the think tank world to uh, give you guys a hard time. I mean, there was that recent failed attempt at reform based on the tripartite negotiation. I'll put this to you though, Uh, Scott Morrison a few months ago said that structural reform, the kind of things we've been talking about, is a vanity project and he's not interested in pursuing them. Is the Prime Minister right? Well, what the Prime Minister has delivered is structural reform and I just mentioned to you the tax system, what I would just, we were able to get through the Parliament this week on superannuation. I mean, what the PM has done overseas in, in securing our free trade agreement with Britain, our fifth largest trading partner. Again, um, free trade is a part of an important job-creating agenda. Um, when we came to government, Tom, uh, 26% of our two-way trading relationships were covered by free trade agreements. Now that's more than 70%. And as you know, we've struck not only agreements with Japan and Korea and Indonesia and now the United Kingdom, but also multilateral deals like the Trans-Pacific Partnership. 
Um, so for, you know, as, a, as a trading nation with one in five Australian jobs related to trade, we're out there prosecuting new markets through new trade agreements uh, for Australian exporters, be they in goods or services. Okay, let's turn to some questions from some of our friends and members. Judith Sloan, a columnist with the Australian newspaper, she says, uh, you and Senator Hume uh, managed to secure the passage of uh, a number of superannuation reforms this week. Notwithstanding the fact that they are often described as controversial uh, in the media, uh, what benefits do you see emerging from these changes? That's Judith Sloan. Josh. Well, Judith is a very uh, well-respected columnist and, uh, and somebody who's been out there prosecuting the case for super reform for some time. Um, what we will see as a result of these changes is lower fees uh, and better returns, and we're expecting um, to deliver savings of more than $17 billion to consumers. So as I said, the stapling of accounts uh, so that it prevents unnecessary unwanted multiple accounts, um, the underperformance of funds being held to account, if they perform below a benchmark, then they have to notify their members. If they keep performing below a benchmark, then they'll be restricted from taking new members. Uh, a best financial interest um, duty, because we want um, uh, super funds to be investing in the asset classes and undertaking expenditure that's consistent with the best financial interests of, of its members. And then, of course, choice, informed choice, mm -hmm. by being able to compare uh, the fund performance. But I also want to point out to your members um, these aren't the only reforms. They're not the first or the last reforms we're doing in super. We've been able to consolidate, <clears throat> consolidate inactive um, low balance accounts. We've banned exit fees. We've capped fees on low balance accounts. We've made it opt in for people to get insurance if they're under 25. So there's a lot of reforms we've undertaken against many vested interests. Okay, another related point that uh, Judith asks is, would the government uh, revisit the case against the further ratcheting up of the super, superannuation contribu contribution charge, uh, this is beyond 10%. Well, we, we have had that legislated, not under our government, but under a previous government, um, and it's scheduled to go to 12%. It goes to 10% um, in the middle of this year, of course. Um, we, we continue to see um, arguments put uh, and the debate being made about the trade-off between the SG, the compulsory super increases, and wages. There are arguments that have been put by the Grattan Institute, by the Reserve Bank, by Judith Sloan, um, and others. And so they're serious arguments. They're arguments that, uh, um, that we uh, um, have been watching very closely. Um, but right now, it's legislated to go to 12%. Okay, Melanie Cheng, she's an undergraduate student and she's going to do our Liberty and Society conference later this year. I think you did that about 20 years ago. I did that many years ago. <laughs> when Mark Latham was running around there. <laughs> was he one of the guest speakers, was he? Melanie says she's 20 and like many you know, young, young Australians, uh, she's worried about the high costs of housing, uh, superannuation, university education, compulsory super, high debt. How will the government address intergenerational inequity? Because the big report, of course, is due very soon. Well, in terms of the uh, IGR, that will be out on the 28th, um, and that's a, an important document um, initiated first by Peter Costello coming out every five years. It's based on existing policy, so you have to bear that in mind when you, you, you look at some of the numbers because, of course, policy settings change over... Uh, over the course of 40 years, but it does have some very interesting uh, findings, whether it's in relation to population, whether it relates to, to, to revenue and expenditure trends, uh, whether it relates to fiscal sustainability as well. Um, there is, an, you know, there is a, a critical point here um, about particularly helping Austra young Australians um, get into the housing market because, uh, and I think she referenced that in, in, in her comments, um, mm. housing prices have been going up. Now, I would rather always housing prices to be going up than going down uh, because you don't want people to have negative equity in their home. And, you know, for most people, their house is their number one asset. So if it's going up, they feel more confident to spend and many small business owners um, mortgage their home to invest in, in, in their business. So um, prices going up is better than prices going down. Uh, and we've 
try to put in place policies that will get first home buyers into the market. And right now we've got uh, first home buyers coming into the market in the strongest numbers we've seen in more than a decade. So programs like Home Builder, the Home Guarantee Scheme, which sees people get into the housing market with deposits as low as 5%, are all important. Um, and we're very much focusing on those intergenerational issues that have been referred to. Okay, next question. A mutual friend of ours, Simon Morden, a board member here at CIS, uh, uh, Josh. Uh, he's actually working in Italy during COVID and he asks, Treasurer, uh, why does Cabinet continue to keep the country closed to people who are vaccinated? Well, again, um, if you look abroad, um, it's not yet clear that people who are vaccinated uh, prevent the transmission um, of the virus um, and we've got to continue to take the medical advice. The more people that get vaccinated, the better um, the economic recovery will be and the safer Australians will be. Um, but we have been very cautious with the border um, with the border closures. We closed mm -hmm. early on to China and then more broadly to other countries. And, Tom, that was a very important decision, took advantage of Australia's geographical place in the world and being an island, and that has helped prevent the the spread of the virus that we saw with such devastating consequences in the United States and the United Kingdom. Yeah, well, um, we are running out of time and it's great you've done this. We have our policy differences, uh, Josh, um, but we thank you for tuning in to uh, CIS today and all the best in coming months. Thanks so much, Josh Frydenberg. Tom, thank you. Thank your membership. Um, I've had a lot to do with the CIS over the years, including being part of its seminars as a young, uh, as a young, as a young person. Um, I hope I'm st staying faithful to, uh, to many of the ideals um, that you pursue and promote. But I just want to leave your members with the knowledge that um, this is a once in a century pandemic. We've had to take some pretty hard decisions, but right now the recovery has been very strong. A generation of Australians have been saved from long-term unemployment and ahead of any advanced economy, be it the UK, the US, Canada, Japan, um, Australia has seen more people in work today than before the pandemic and our economy bigger today than before the pandemic. That's something I think everyone can be proud of. Josh, thanks so much. And thanks to all of you who have tuned in today. If you'd like to hear more about us or become a member, just go to cis.org.au and follow the prompts. I'm Tom Switzer from CIS and we hope you can tune in again next time.